As a surgeon, I can tell you that one of the more heartbreaking things that we encounter is uh, the knowledge that a patient could be cured if you could just get the tumor out completely. Um, and sometimes that's really just not possible because um, the only way to get it out is to hurt the patient. There's no place where that is a more important issue than in CNS malignancies. So Dr. Sandro Santagata is a neuropathologist um, at Brigham and Women's who's been doing work on mass spec imaging with molecular pathology to better define resection of um, tumors of the CNS. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Monica. That was very nice. And um, uh, thank you all for coming uh, this morning to, for this talk. What I'd like to do in this very brief um, presentation is to give you uh, a broad view of some of, the, um, some of the work we're doing at Brigham and Women's Hospital in, in tissue molecular imaging. And what I'd like to point out is this is a multidisciplinary effort, um, multiple departments, uh, multiple investigators. This is spearheaded by uh, a good colleague of mine, Natalie Agar, in neurosurgery and radiology, Alex Golby, who's a neurosurgeon, and my laboratory in the Department of Pathology. But what I want to show is you know, an operating room from 1923 and our most advanced operating room, the uh, Amigo, the Advanced Multimodality Image Guided Operating Room at, at Brigham. And uh, dramatically different, but the goal of the neurosurgeon is essentially the same, take out as much tumor without causing harm to the patient, without damaging vital regions of the brain. The neurosurgeons have a tremendous number of new tools to help them achieve that, neuronavigation uh, instruments, as well as uh, an intraoperative MRI, as you can see over here. But in pathology, um, we're still using a technique uh, during the operation that was invented over 150 years ago uh, by Verkau and colleagues, um, which is the frozen section. We get a piece of tumor from the, from the, or a piece of tissue from the surgeon, we freeze it, we take a thin section, we, we stain it with dyes, we look under the microscope, and we provide a diagnosis. Now that technique is very powerful and hence its longevity. However, it's a bit cumbersome, time consuming. We only can do one or two of those really uh, you know, in, in, in the time frame of an operation. Um, it's fraught with artifacts. Uh, we can sometimes misdiagnose things. And even under the best of conditions, uh, we're still not tapping into the, the vast amount of molecular information that's trapped, sometimes never to be extracted from that piece of tissue. So essentially we need new tools is the, is the message. Um, so to do that, and to provide a molecular characterization of tissue during an operation, we've turned to uh, developing intraoperative mass spectrometry. So this is a mass spectrometer. It's in our operating room in the Amigo, and we use it regularly to provide information, uh, at least to collect information, hopefully soon to provide it directly back to the surgeons once our IRB uh, approvals go through. And this is the type of data that we get. It's very simple. We, we measure the mass of the molecules that are in the tissue. This is uh, mass spectra from a high-grade uh, brain tumor, a glioblastoma, and you can see the various peaks. And now we can capture this rapidly in an operation because of advances in ambient ionization. Basically, the ability to get ions into the mass spectrometer now is relatively easy. We don't need a laser uh, for this particular approach, no vacuum, no matrix, and no sample preparation. We smear the tissue on a slide, we put it into, onto this platform, and we collect the data. So it's rapid, and we're measuring endogenous molecules here. What's important for us as a validation step is we, you know, in our, in our development work, we section the tissue, and then we collect the mass spec data, and then we can overlay this because it's a non-destructive technique. We can uh, preserve the tissue and look at the histology correlating which peaks correspond to which type of tissue. Is it viable tumor? Is it necrotic? Is there blood? Is there, are there a lot of lymphocytes? Is it stroma or is it normal brain uh, that we're looking at? So it's very helpful because the tissues can be, even in a, in a tiny piece of tissue, can be very heterogeneous. Uh, someday we hope to do this all with a handheld device, but we're not quite there yet. We've collected hundreds of uh, mass spectra from hundreds of tissue samples, and now we have complex signatures that we can use to discriminate various tumors from one another, low-grade tumors that are going to behave indolently from high-grade tumors that are going to be more, more um, aggressive. But the neat part is that sometimes we can, we can do this all from, we can provide a lot of information from just one peak. So there, there are a large class of uh, gruliomas, brain tumors, that, uh, that are low-grade, that need to be resected well for, for a good patient outcome. And most of those have a mutation in an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. And when this enzyme is mutated, uh, there's a very, very large amount of accumulation of what we call an oncometabolite, 2-hydroxyglutarate, 2-HG. 
So here you can see this one peak very clearly. We can put this in the mass spec, fragment it, and, and, and confirm that it indeed is what we think it is. And then we can also collect that from multiple samples through the operation and put it back onto the, onto the uh, map them back onto the uh, preoperative MRI. So the goal of this now is we'll hopefully soon be able to provide this information back to the surgeons who can now iteratively, iteratively go through the resection cavity and ask, is there residual tumor? We can identify approximately you know, down to 5% residual tumor. So this will be an advance for the surgeons to be able to, to um, improve their resections. Now, this is one metabolite. Obviously, there are many in tissues, uh, the many lipids, phospholipids, and and like, for instance, oleic acid is, is, a, is a molecule that we detect in breast cancer. This is a breast, a, a breast metastasis to the brain. Here are the tumor cells. And you can see there's a different peak over here with another signal. And this is the signal from sulfatides that we get from normal brain. So we can tell immediately that this is uh, breast cancer and that it's uh, abutting a piece of normal brain here. So there's a lot that we can do with this type of approach. And again, many, many, many different molecules that we can look at, including signatures. Now, we don't only do ambient ionization uh, in an intraoperative setting. We're trying to develop also MALDI uh, matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization techniques for mass spec imaging, MALDI imaging in the operating room. And here's an example of MALDI imaging of a piece of uh, pituitary from an autopsy case where you have the anterior pituitary that produces a lot of the hormones that we know and the posterior pituitary producing vasopressin. You can see we can detect vasopressin very well. MALDI is better for detecting higher molecular weight molecules, uh, such as vasopressin, adrenocorticotrophin hormone, which is in the anterior pituitary, and growth hormone, which is uh, positioned here laterally. So we can also uh, section and image, uh, in the time that it takes to do a frozen section, in fact, um, pieces of pituitary resections during operations, usually these tumors, some of them can be very small, the ACTH ones in particular can be tiny, and this can help us localize the tumor, characterize the, the molecules that are present in it and provide, hopefully, information to the surgeon. And this is the, the steps that we're taking right now. Now, this is um, yet another application of uh, mass spec imaging that we're performing. And this is a xenograft of a brain tumor into, the, into, the, into a mouse's brain. And we'd also like to look at drugs and whether they're reaching the tissue um, that they're supposed to be reaching, particularly in the brain with the blood-brain barrier. This is a, an, important, um, an important issue. Um, um, we, we map, for instance, here we, we, can, we can detect heme, and we use this to map the vasculature of the brain, so we know where the blood vessels actually are. And then uh, we can also detect some drugs, many drugs actually, um, in, in the tissue as well. And we can then map where, this, where these molecules are in relation to the tumor and in relationship to the blood vessels. What's neat about this mass spec imaging um, finding is that when we, it, it looks in the prior image that, um, that the, 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 RAF, the BRAF inhibitor was present in the xenograft. However, when you look very closely, uh, this is a signal for heme, and this is the signal for, uh, for, the, for the, the drug. And it was collecting uh, in, in the vasculature uh, and not, not disseminating freely, as you might have expected from the earlier image, in the, in the brain and in, in the tumor tissue. So uh, this type of information can be very helpful in terms of drug development, uh, pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic. Uh, uh, experiments and analyses, both in mice, but also from human samples collected during clinical trials. And now I just want to shift gears slightly, because what I've been showing you is sort of like a lower resolution type of imaging, and as pathologists, we're, we're high resolution, uh, high acuity type uh, folks. So we can also collect uh, imaging and information using different techniques, not just mass spectrometry, but also stimulated Raman imaging. And I won't go into the, into the, the science of, the, of, the, of, the, of Raman imaging, However, just, just to point out that we can detect subcellular, uh, submicron uh, signals. So for instance, here, uh, this is an image from the brain, and we can, we can see lipids. For instance, all, the, all this green here, these are various processes in the white matter of the brain, which is lipid rich. The gray matter, which is uh, protein rich, however, with neurons, is present over here. And that, we, we color code that blue. In a tumor, we can see the, the blue tumor cells here infiltrating through and disrupting the, the yellow, uh, green um, axons of, of the brain, causing these bulbous protrusions. And that's kind of a, a great signal that we have infiltrating glioma. We can also detect blood vessels very clearly. Again, this is, there are no labels here. This is all endogenous signals from, from the tissue. Red blood cells, uh, vasculature, we can detect um, uh, proliferated blood vessels, which is a hallmark of glioblastoma. These, uh, these are images of lipid droplets or lipid-filled organelles within uh, glioblastoma cells, so we can detect that, stuff that we can't really even see in pathology because the lipids are sort of washed away uh, when, we, when we do our processing. And in certain tissues, for instance, the skin, 
uh, we, we can detect um, DNA in the nuclei, even nucleoli over here, if I can straighten out my pointer, those little dots over there. Um, and that's also a helpful feature to delineate the nuclei and to, to be able to visualize uh, nuclear conformation, et cetera. So, you know, in summary, you know, we, we, we have new tools now in pathology. We're trying to apply these in the interoperative setting. We're in early stages of collecting the data, making algorithms, providing that information back to the surgeons, hopefully in time. Some of these techniques are, I think, ready for interoperative testing. Others are in development, but we're, we're getting there. And we have a really uh, large team of people. I just want to you know, highlight, obviously, my very good collaborator, Natalie Agar in neurosurgery and radiology, Alex Golby in neurosurgery, Shani Shi, uh, who we do the Raman work with, but a whole vast collection of people and, uh, and a great team. Um, so thank you very much. And two, one, zero. <laughs>